the shooting range. In this episode, one of the best aircraft of World War II and the trouble of getting anything from the Germans. The amazing Mach-E C-205 Veltro. The same lethality, but faster, or how the KV-1S tank came into being. Hotline. The developers answer questions that you left in the comments. But first, let's start with a recap of everything we can currently say about the upcoming World War game mode. What is World War? Basically, it's our dream vision for what our game can do – a special game mode where War Thunder squadrons go into battle for world domination on a truly massive scale, with multiple theaters of war and multiple historical operations to choose from. The core idea of the game mode is that every action by every player will affect the situation on the global map. There will be a special strategic layer to it, as commanders will move their armies across the map, plan offensives, organize their defenses and manage their resources and reinforcements. And we are preparing a number of special engagements for this mode, from convoy missions to anti-air defense missions. The big news is that we're planning to run a close test World War mode in the closest future. Will it only be available to squadrons? Actually, no. In the final version of this game mode, solo players will be able to take part in these huge battles as well. But during the initial CBT stages, we will be specifically testing the strategic part of the mode. So it's more practical for us to recruit the help of organized communities and squadron leaders. That's why right now only squadrons are in. What mode will the battles take place in? RB with markers. We figured that there can only be one world war happening at any given time, so everybody will be fighting under the same rules. How will the CBT be done? Basically, there will be three stages. First, we'll need to make sure that everything works. During this technical test stage, we'll select between two and six squadrons, and then we will do our best to break the game. Then, the time will come for the balancing stage. This time around, we'll employ 10 to 30 squadrons that will be chosen randomly from the total of all squadrons that pass the selection criteria. The final stage is called the stress test stage. 30 plus squadrons will be participating and we'll do our best to allow all squadrons that pass the selection criteria to get into the fray. Where can I volunteer? There is a special application form on our site. There are two things to consider here. You need at least 26 players, one commander, 20 members and 5 people for the backup. For every session. And the application form is only available for commanders, their deputies and officers. Good luck, soldiers! The war is looming! Next up is the story of the Russian Colossus, or how the USSR had to drop the production of its almost invulnerable tank. In the summer of 1941, the Soviet heavy tank called the KV had better armor and, with some reservations, a better gun than any of its German rivals. But in 1942, it was taken out of production. The Soviets swiftly replaced the KV-1 with the KV-1S, which was basically a polished version of the same tank. Was there an actual need to do that? Why was the original KV discontinued while the German tanks of its generation were still being produced en masse? Well, to start with, the main stumbling block of the tank was its transmission, which was a 20-year-old Caterpillar design. It was hard to operate, prone to failure and overheating. Simply put, the tank was not a joy to ride. The engine cooling system wasn't top-notch either. When the outside temperature approached 20 degrees Celsius or higher, which wasn't that hot, honestly, the KV-1 started to have troubles with its fifth gear which was understandable because the water and oil inside the machinery were boiling at this point, and the driver had to switch back to the fourth gear. Furthermore, these tanks had poor visibility with narrow vision slits. Just an example for you. During the Winter War, when the KV-1 was sent to be tested in combat conditions, it once got in a very weird situation. It was approaching enemy positions and suddenly came under fire. Enemy guns were unable to penetrate its armor, which was a very common thing at the time, but the commander of the tank was just unable to locate the enemy. In the end, he had to recruit the help of the crew, at the expense of what they were actually supposed to be doing. And after some time, the tankers managed to spot the target, but it wasn't the commander who saw it first. 
All of these flaws were not addressed before the war, and once the war started, the situation got even worse as there was a noticeable drop in quality of the final product. At the same time, the Soviets made a conscious decision to prioritize quantity over quality, so any kind of redesign was out of question. It was very much needed though. There was a constant stream of reports saying that the vehicle was not reliable, cumbersome and too heavy. The last straw was the wide-scale transmission breakdown of 1942. Some tanks were falling apart after just 120 to 130 kilometers on the road. Something had to be done. In the spring and summer of 1942, the Soviet engineers gave a thorough shakeup to the tank's design. A talented engineer called Nikolai Sashmurin created a sophisticated planetary transmission, which, among other things, allowed the vehicle to achieve the top speed of 43 kilometers an hour. Hence the name KV-1S, or Skorosnoy, which means the fast one. What was even more important was that the new transmission was much more reliable and easier to use. The driver could finally concentrate on their driving instead of making the damn thing work. The cooling system received an upgrade as well. And the tank got a new turret with slightly sloped sides, which was also fitted with a real commander cupola bearing all-around vision blocks. It wasn't the most ergonomic design, but it did improve the overall vision, and that was great. In order to make this happen and retain a degree of quality, some sacrifices had to be made. The engineering team decided to downgrade the superior armor of the tank, and the changes were drastic. For example, the frontal armor, which was 105mm thick, was now only 75mm thick. On the other hand, the Soviet army finally got a versatile and relatively agile vehicle, which was very much appreciated by the soldiers on the front line, and paved the way for the mighty IS tank family. And now, let's talk about arguably the best Italian aircraft of World War II. It was a miracle of sorts. An Italian engineer called Mario Costoldi got a hold of an engine used at the BF-109E and built an aircraft which was better than the BF-109E in every conceivable way. Just think about it. Even after Willy Messerschmitt reworked the aerodynamics of his plane and outfitted it with excellent DB-601N engine, it was still not as good as the Folgore. The Italian machine had only one big flaw. It didn't have much in terms of firepower. It carried only four guns, two of which were puny Breda 7.7mm machine guns that were largely inefficient. Mario Costoldi was well aware of this problem. That's why, once he learned that the Germans made a new version of the DB-601 engine, which allowed the use of an engine cannon, Costoldi immediately started to work on the new aircraft design. It was just the start of 1941, and the engineer believed that getting this engine to Italy would be a matter of a couple of weeks. And then, the Regia Aeronautica would get an upgraded version of the Folgori with an excellent engine cannon. Sounds pretty straightforward, right? Costoldi didn't even need the engine at hand to get on with the redesign. He pressed forward, relying purely on his intuition and a wealth of experience. The new, more powerful motor was likely to produce more heat, all right? Let's think of a new cooling system. What about the oil cooler? Could we just make the old chin-mounted one bigger? No, it would screen off the water radiator. Okay, let's refit the aircraft with a distinct twin-barrel-shaped oil cooler arrangement, leaving enough space between the two so that there would be no problems with the water radiator. Throw in a retractable tailwheel and a couple of minor modifications, and the Mach-E C202 bis was ready, sans the engine. And that was the problem. To put it bluntly, the engine was not coming to Italy. The Germans didn't even consider sending the blueprints or a copy. Clearly, Willy Messerschmitt was not too happy with the surprising success of the Mach-E C202 and made sure that the engine would not get to Italy. That's why instead of soaring into the skies, the MC202 bis was only collecting dust for quite some time. Everything changed in 1942 when the German war machine had skipped a beat or two. The tanks of Wehrmacht were stopped before they reached Moscow. The threat of an invasion of Britain ended, and the Rommel's Africa Corps were clearly having a hard time. Under these circumstances, Germans simply could not afford to satisfy the whims of Messerschmitt, and the Italian engineers promptly received all the blueprints and materials needed to start manufacturing powerful DB-605A engines. 
the Italian military knew very well that Castoldi had redesigned his Fulgori for a better engine, and naturally, they ordered him to make use of new German mortar. The aircraft engineer did his best to explain that the DB605A was 150 kilograms heavier than the DB601, and that such a difference meant that they needed a completely different aircraft for the job, but to no avail. The orders were clear. And that's how the Regia Aeronautica got its new fighter aircraft, the Maki C205 Veltro. The first two series of this fighter still had an underwhelming choice of arms. It carried the same machine guns as the Folgori. And Mario Costoldi was right. The new engine was so heavy that you couldn't even dream of installing an engine cannon, or fighting at high altitudes for that matter. Thankfully, the Series 3 got two Mauser MG-151 cannons to go with two Breda machine guns, so there was that. But even without its crucial upgrade and with all the problems stemming from getting a heavier engine, the new fighter was still great. A real thing of beauty. It is small wonder that the folks at the Regia Aeronautica didn't hesitate to order this aircraft into mass production. And Costoldi later managed to get his chance to design a new machine around the DB605A engine. But that's a story for another time. Get ready for the traditional last part of our show, Hotline. Developers answering questions from the comments. Strictly speaking, it's not the most serious-minded section of the show. If you want answers to be given with solemn faces, feel free to appeal to the official War Thunder forums. Here we'll have a more lighthearted discussion of the big questions of War Thunder. The first question comes from a user called Albin Quid. Are you going to add post-World War II pilot models for the Japanese, the Germans and the British, like you recently did for the Italians? We'll be upgrading pilot models all across the board. We'll see what kind of skins they will be, though. Then there's a message from a player called Professor Baustert. Can I attach a sniper rifle to my plane? A true gentleman makes do with a revolver or a knife. Next question comes from a person with an unpronounceable nickname. Sorry, mate, we tried. Gaijin, I've been doing my World War II Italian tank homework and found some… So, can we build hype for Italian tanks in the future? Yeah, sure, we are working on it. Cannot give you an ATA yet, though. Sam Smola asks, will the PO2 ever get up tiered to its rightful BR of 9.0? We were thinking more along the lines of 11.0, actually. The last message comes from a user called Silverbutt. Tomorrow, it will be exactly one year since the first episode of The Shooting Range. Exactly, mate. We hope you enjoy watching it as much as we enjoy making it. And we're planning something special for our next 50th episode of the show. We want to celebrate our community and everything we like about War Thunder. This is, of course, completely impossible without your input. Please tell us the craziest, the most amazing and unforgettable stories that happened with you in the game. And feel free to ask us any kind of backstage questions for a special kind of hotline. We'll try to tell you as much as we can about our favorite vehicles, types of food, the life at the office, etc. etc. Really looking forward to seeing your comments. This is it for today, but feel free to write your questions in the comments below. We do read them all, and you might see some of them answered in the next episode. If you like what we're doing, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you on the shooting range.